Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you all for joining another STEC session. My name is Adam Greco, and I'll be kind of moderating behind the scenes during John's presentation. This presentation is in our data strategy area and will be presented by John Lovett from Search Discovery. Um, just a couple housekeeping items before we uh, dive in. Let John move forward for me. If you are new to the SDEC, if uh, you haven't been to an event before, the SDEC is a free educational community where we provide weekly webinars like this on a bunch of topics related to digital marketing and digital analytics. You can see all of the 12 topics here. If you are no, not yet a member of the SDEC, just um, email me at sdec at searchdiscovery.com. And I'll also be putting a link to join uh, the SDEC in the chat of the Zoom meeting. If you are in the SDEC, but you're not uh, signed up for the right topics, or maybe you changed your mind, you could just email me at sdec at searchdiscovery.com and just send me a note and say, hey, I want to make sure I'm part of business intelligence or I want to make sure I'm part of paid, paid media. Uh, so just email me and I can make any adjustments. And once you join the SDEC, the benefit is that you will get email invitations to all of these events proactively, so you don't have to worry about missing any of them. Next slide, please. Uh, we do have an, a Slack group for the SDEC, but unfortunately, we only have uh, about 69% of you in the Slack group. I'm not sure why, because it's free and only takes about a second to join. Um, if you join the Slack group, you have access to over 40 past webinars that we've done um, going back all the way to, I think, May or June of last year. You also are one click away from reaching out and sending a direct message to over 3,000 people in the analytics community. And we have job postings out there if anyone wants to uh, get a new job or post a job at your company. So if you are in the group, but for some reason you never got uh, the invite to the Slack group, again, just email me at sdec at searchdiscovery.com and say, hey, I need to be in the Slack group and I will send you a link to join. And then lastly, uh, as we're going through the webinar today, if you have any technical difficulties or questions about the SDEC, go ahead and use the chat function and I will see if I can help you out. If you have questions for our presenter, John, uh, please use the Q&A instead of the chat because that way everyone can see the questions that you're posting and they can vote them up and so on. This webinar will be recorded as always and will be posted later today in the Slack group and as you've gotten the gist so far, if you have any questions about anything, uh, SDEC at searchdiscovery.com. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. John, go ahead. Thanks, Adam. And hello, everybody. Um, as Adam mentioned, my name is John Lovett, and thanks for joining this SDEC presentation on Making Data Literacy Your New Year's Resolution. Um, again, I'm John Lovett. I'm the Senior Director of Data Strategy at Search Discovery. Um, I'd also like to you know, provide a big thanks and shout out to my longtime colleague, Adam Greco, for establishing this great community. Like he said, there's so many great resources here. I've certainly got a lot out of it over the past year, and I hope you do too. So let's jump right in. So in 2021, data literacy is no longer just a nice to have. It's a must have for everyone. It's a must have for survival. It's really a must have for living. And, and by that, I mean, you're not going to get through the 21st century without being data literate. So if data literacy is really that important, what is it? I'd like to start out today with a few definitions. So according to Wikipedia, data literacy is the ability to read, understand, create, and communicate data as information. Gartner tells us, that data literacy is the ability to read, write, and communicate data in context, including an understanding of data sources and constructs. Here at Search Discovery, we talk about data literacy as the ability to interpret, understand, and communicate data within a shared context. But really the best definition of data literacy, it's your definition. We can listen to all the experts and all the analysts, but really defining data literacy, whether you talk about data informed decision making, metrics literacy, tool literacy, or any other shades of literacy, 
absolutely positively make sure that it resonates with your company. Otherwise, it won't be used. So you really need to make sure that it's going to be in line with what your company needs and what your company stands for with regard to literacy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So as we kind of level set here, I'm going to ask Adam to put up our first poll uh, question for the group here. So you should be able to see on your screen, does your organization currently have a data literacy effort underway? Um, and we'll wait just a second here to let some of these, uh, these votes come in. Answer choices. Yes, we currently have a data literacy initiative underway. Yes. Whoop. Uh, <laughs> looks like our poll question got a duplicate question in there, Adam. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll just cue this up as a yes or no. Uh, the second one should read, uh, uh, we don't have one underway, but we plan to. Uh, and then the third one will be a no. I apologize about that, John. <laughs> no, for now. We'll just go with the yes or no question. Uh, let's see what we got for responses. And then presumably my screen's going to change, Adam? Yep, I'm just going to give it, we got about 67% voted. So I'm going to give it another couple seconds. Now you've got me nervous about the next poll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another five seconds. Got about 75% of the people have voted. Okay, so here are the results. All right. It looks like about 56% uh, don't have and don't have plans to start. Well, hopefully uh, my efforts here today can convince you that uh, it's worth starting one and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So thank you for participating in that first poll. Uh, okay, so why is data literacy important? Uh, now that we know what it is, let's talk a little bit about the reasons why. So. Data is a business requirement. The fact is that most modern businesses can't run without data today. They just can't do it. It's true. Uh, data is a requirement for conducting business no matter what your business is. Try building a business case without any data. It's not possible. Try understanding conversions without any data. Again, it's not possible. How about try analyzing your marketing efforts to determine what's working and what's not without data? You just can't do it. We need data to run our businesses. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit here. You know, data is used in business for really three primary reasons. The first one is to improve decision making. This is one that you're going to hear over and over again, and it's a given. Uh, but to illustrate this, Bain and Company surveyed 400 businesses last year and found that companies with advanced data analytics capabilities were five times more likely to make decisions faster and more effectively than their market peers. But in addition to that, another purpose for, for um, why data is used is really to revamp and refine operations. Think about this one as operational efficiency. Data can show us if we're wasting time and energy on certain functions. It can also tell us where to focus our efforts on the most profitable areas of the business or which ones are needing critical attention. And then the third reason why data is used in business is to create new revenue streams. Data really is a business asset. Think about companies like IBM who went out and purchased the Weather Channel for an estimated $2 billion. You know why they did it? For the data. They're monetizing this investment by selling weather-related data and they effectively created a new revenue stream for themselves. So data really is important. It's a business requirement. It's the, a function in everything that we do in business. But don't take my word for it. Just look around you. Organizations like the Data Literacy Project and Dataversity are popping up as resources to help businesses get a handle on data literacy. They're producing research, papers like these, the human impact of data literacy and how to lead, uh, lead with data, how to drive data literacy in the enterprise. Um, these things, you know, th this is great information that's out there, but the media is also paying attention. Uh, InfoWorld talks about why it's essential. Harvard Business Review tells us how to boost your team's data literacy. And then vendors uh, like Tableau are talking about they're getting into the data literacy game. And of course, 
uh, all the major analyst companies from Gartner to Forrester are writing about data literacy too. Everywhere you look, data literacy is all around us. People are talking about it. It is very much at the top of people's minds coming out of 2020 and going into the year 2021. But data literacy isn't just important in business. We interpret, we interpret data every day, every single day. I'm sure you've seen something like this. Um, you look at a, uh, it's something that's presented on the screen or a similar format every day or at least every week. So let me ask you, I particularly like this uh, way of presenting a seven day forecast. So the first question I'll ask you, we can see here that this is a week, starts on Friday, uh, but there's something special about the way that this data is presented. So let me ask you a question. Uh, which day of the week will be the coldest day of the week? Just think to yourselves, what's it gonna be? So I'll reveal the answer. It's gonna be Monday. We can see, oh, now not only is it giving me information here, but it's also proportional. They're giving me some clues about what that looks like. So let me ask you here again, what's gonna be the warmest day of the week? Can you tell just by looking at this? That's right, it's gonna be Friday. That's the warmest day of this week. There's a whole lot of information in this one graph and whether you realize it or not, you're interpreting this data. So I'll do one more quick and let me ask you one more question. Now that we see all the information revealed here, minus Tuesday, what's the temperature gonna be on Tuesday? So if you guess 35 degrees, you're right. The data told us that. We could see that that bar chart was similar to Sunday's. And we can infer from that, that that was the information we needed to be able to determine what the temperature was gonna be on that day. These are small facets of being data literate. Let's look at another example. It's required for interpreting our world. So I'm gonna ask Adam to launch our second poll here as I talk you through this chart. Okay, so you should see the poll. Um, what I'm gonna ask you to do here is determine how many clicks does it take for you to understand what's going on in this chart? What does this chart mean? So if you know right now what's happening in this chart, it's zero clicks. Go ahead and hit that one. And what I'll do for you, the first part or piece of information that I'll reveal is what is this dotted line showing us? So as I click through and reveal that, Okay, this is healthcare system capacity. If now you get that moment, you say, oh, now I know what they're talking about. Go ahead and click one click. I'll reveal the x-axis. Time since the first case, that's two clicks. You know it now? How about if I give you the third click, the number of cases? If you don't know it yet, I'll show you all the information. So, the reason why I showed you this, this chart is about flattening the curve. We've all heard about, you know, COVID certainly affected everyone's lives. Um, we've all heard about this, but you probably were able to interpret this slide and know what was going on before all the information was clicked through. Adam, can you show us the results? All right, so about 27% of you got it in zero clicks. Uh, other, a quarter of you got it within one click. So that's half of you guys got this within one click. You knew what was going on in this graph. Um, you know, congratulate yourselves. That's being data literate. Others, it took a little bit longer and that's okay. Sometimes we need more information or if you're not familiar with this, I didn't give you much context, but that just tells us that information we're discerning based on the amount of literacy or how much context we have with the information that we're being provided. So let's, let's proceed here. Uh, another example that I'd like to show, we were bombarded with data in 2020. It was a tough year in many ways. Uh, but let's take a look at this map of the United States. It, this map was published by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, to show the number of COVID-19 cases by county within each state. This is great information. It's great data. But I would argue that this is kind of hard to understand. What do the different shades of blue signify? Maybe you can guess but we really need the key to understand what's going on in this chart. And as we reveal that, we can see, oh, the greenish color is fewer cases and the dark blue is more cases by county. Okay, now I'm starting to get that. Um, but the thing about data is there are many ways to show data. So this is one view. Let's take another click here. 
So this is another chart from a different source, but it's effectively revealing the same information, the total number of COVID cases by county in 2020. This one, in my opinion, is much easier to see the areas that were impacted. Those red circles, wow, something's going on there. I can tell really what's happening there. So I use this just to illustrate that there are lots of different ways to talk about data. And then as data literate people, we can interpret these in, di in different ways. Even if you know everything about a certain part of information, if you need the key to decipher what's going on, that's not quite as helpful as a chart like this that might reveal more just by, at a single glance. The data delusion 2020 just didn't give up. In November of last year, most Americans and perhaps most of the world were glued to their news outlets who were presenting data on the results of the United States presidential elections. If you were like me, you watched anxiously as analysts and reporters played out scenarios about what might happen in the swing states. We watched Pennsylvania to determine, you know, was it going to go red or was it going to go blue? This was data that was being presented to us in real time and we were looking at it and trying to make decisions or determine how it was gonna impact or affect our lives. So as we looked at that collectively, as we watched, data was revealed in countless ways that tried to help us understand what was happening, both as both popular and electoral votes were being tallied. This first image shows the most common way that we were presented with data on which political party won each of the states depicted. But politically literate people realized that it wasn't the state that mattered. It was the number of electoral college votes that decided the outcome. So we were presented with charts like this one. Now, that's a very different look. We start to understand this is a new way of presenting that information where we can see that Joe Biden received 306 electoral votes, whereas Donald Trump only 232. I will mention to you guys, this data is from the New York Times as part of an ongoing series that asks, what's going on with this graph? I love this series. I recommend you check it out. Basically what it does is it puts up charts or data visualizations that people have to interpret and students are encouraged to chime in and talk about what they're seeing in the data. Fantastic resource. I'll have a link for you at the end of the presentation. So this data deluge did not give up. But since we're talking about the United States by county, I thought I'd show you this. Data deception, or in some cases, misconception, so a very real thing. Back in September of 2019, during the Donald Trump's first impeachment hearings, his daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, who's married to Donald's son, Eric, tweeted out a message that said, try to impeach this, with a map of the counties that voted Republican in the 2016 election against Hillary Clinton. The problem with this tweet that Lara put out was twofold. So basically the first, the map was originally published by the Huffington Post, but it displays multiple red counties that were in fact won by Hillary and should have been blue. Now, there's an understandable reason for this. It takes some time to count the votes. It takes some time for things to turn. That could have been a, a minimal data error. The bigger problem upon seeing Lara's tweet um, was it, the, the egregious problem here a Belgian designer named Kareem Duib, uh, I may have butchered his name, but he runs the data visualization company called Jetpack, took this challenge upon himself. And the basis for his argument was that people vote, land don't vote. Land doesn't vote, excuse me. So basically what he showed was the map shouldn't look like this. It should look more like this. This is really where the population of voters across each of these counties exists. And if we take his visualization even one step further, we can see really this is a country divided. If we looked at this, it doesn't look like that massive red map that we saw at first. It's a divided country with reds and blues. So I show you this because the data visualization is why we see, you know, it, it can be misleading. There's lots of ways to present data and lots of ways to show information for either good or uh, whatever reason you might have. But ultimately, let's talk about data, why and how it should be used for company alignment. So the first thing you, know, you need to think about as you're thinking about data literacy as a resolution or something you wanna do for your company or your organization, what's most important to you? And hopefully you get to some sort of company goals. Um, 
your primary goal of a data literacy program uh, might be, you know, building a culture of data driven decision making. Or maybe you're trying to maximize the investment in marketing technologies by increasing an understanding of data and the utilization of platforms. Or perhaps you're looking to increase marketing effect effectiveness by empowering someone at your organization to use data for analysis, reporting, and optimization. Ultimately, you need to ask yourself, how do we know if we've achieved our goals? And the answer, my friends, it falls within your data. Using this data to set targets, goals, objectives, to be able to understand this creates alignment for your organization, which is a very, very powerful thing. Getting companies aligned, whether it's just, you know, what are the definitions we use for our most important KPIs? Do we all understand them? That's alignment. How do we look at our data coming from our analytics tools and make sure that everyone is interpreting and understanding the information as it's shown? That's company alignment. Simply having a hallway conversation and not having to say, what do you mean by bounce rate? What does that actually mean? Or what do you, uh, my definition of a customer is different than yours. Let's get aligned on that. Data can help us do that. And data literacy is the tool with which we use to be able to gain that company alignment. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how do you build a data literacy program? And what I'll reveal here are five steps to a data literate workforce. So um, essentially the, these steps, and I'll walk through each of these, um, but you start by assessing your audience. So know who you're talking to. Following that, the second step is develop your learning objectives. Once you have these things set, then you're going to design a curriculum. Number four, you're gonna implement a solution and then like all good analysts, we're gonna measure the results and figure out how we did. So let's dive in a little bit and see uh, what each of these steps means. The first one, step one, assessing your audience. There's actually lots of different ways to be able to do this. You can either, either you know your team and you know what they're capable of, maybe you ask them or perhaps even test them. Uh, we've effectively built data literacy programs using all of these methods but really you need to find out what's important to your audience. What do they know? What don't they know? And the way that you design a data literacy program, you need to make sure that it suits both their needs and yours. So going back to those goals, you don't just wanna build something that's gonna help people to uh, make better use of the, the tools that you have. You need to make sure that it aligns with your company vision and your company mission. And also keep in mind, data literacy isn't a one size fits all program. Just because your competitor or perhaps your, your spouse or your partner uh, has a data literacy program at their organization, uh, they should be bes bespoke. And by that, I mean, they need to be customized for the people at your organization and the information that you want to convey within context of your business. That's how it needs to be customized because they are not one size fits all. So step two. Developing your learning objectives requires a process. Uh, learning objectives have been around since the 1950s. This concept was originally pioneered by a man named Benjamin Bloom, who was an educational psychologist at the University of Chicago. Bloom created a taxonomy that includes six levels designed to structure objectives, lessons, and assessments. And I'll show you that in a second here. But the really what you need to take from this, the core is that it's a way for educators to structure sequence and plan out learning goals for students. So remember, first we understand who we're talking to and then we discern what is it that we wanna teach them. A learning objective is one of three course components that ensures a consistent structure. And we talk about a learning objective. So what are they gonna learn? What, how are we gonna teach them? What are those instructional activities? And then how will we assess how well they've done? So let's look a little further at this. So this is uh, a, a, an image that shows Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and it's a powerful tool because it explains the process of learning. This taxonomy is hierarchical, meaning that higher level learning is dependent upon prerequisite knowledge or skills. Oof, that's a, that's a mouthful. But essentially what it boils down to, if you start at the bottom, the purple, you know, before you can understand something, you must remember it. To apply a concept, you must first understand it. To evaluate a process, you must have analyzed it. 
And to create something, you must have completed an evaluation. So Bloom helps us to be able to figure out what's the sequence of how do I really teach something? How am I able to create something, whether it's a KPI, whether it's a brief to track a marketing campaign, any number of different facets that you might use in business, determine how you're going to be able to do that. Bloom's taxonomy can help us there. But you don't need to keep all this in mind. Uh, we've simplified this for you and how you can write a uh, an effective learning objective SDI created a free guide on developing them. And basically there's, there's four steps here. Uh, learning objectives begin with the phrase, or in this case, if we're thinking about data literacy, after completing a training module on something, participants will be able to, and here we can say, all right, let's talk about metrics and KPIs. Okay, what's the next step? Select an action verb. It's going to indicate the performance by the learner. Use verbs that describe an action that is observable and measurable within that teaching time frame. Okay, so we wanna identify, we wanna understand what's happening. And the third step is describing the situation of the participants. So where are we here? Well, we really wanna understand which KPIs should we use for tracking lead generation. And then the final step in developing the objective describes the change in behavior. So you might say, I'm gonna do this when I'm reporting to leadership. So as we put this all together, it looks like something like this. After completing the training module on metrics and KPIs, participants will be able to identify which KPIs to use for tracking lead generation when reporting to leadership. And that's a learning objective. So as we move forward, the third step in building your data literacy program involves designing a curriculum. And this is really how you fulfill your learning objectives. So Literacy modules can include anything under the sun, whatever you need to know. But typically the way that we structure our curriculums, you might wanna start with something like a data 101. What are we talking about here? How do we level set? What information do we have? Uh, and then uh, getting into something like data informed decision-making. This is probably the data informed decision. That's probably the most common buzzword you've heard in all of 2020. And in our data literacy curriculum, we actually break it down. We define it. We talk about what it means in the context of performance measurement and hypothesis validation. I can't tell you how much confusion and misunderstanding just this simple module has dispelled when we've done these programs. It just helps people to align on, what are we really talking about here? Other level setting things are, uh, or topics could be effective communication, data visualization, storytelling, and then you might get into some role specific topics. Things like, you know, we use data management governance for IT folks. Um, we need to understand, you know, how do we do this? Or our technical people working with analytics tools get a lot of value out of that. But then there's also topics like, oh, analytics for executives, for managers, for analysts, or maybe you wanna go into optimization or maybe data science. You know, all of these things, we can come up with a list of thousands of different uh, modules that are gonna fit into your plan but again, it goes back to what matters to your business. Step four, when you're implementing your data literacy solution, it typically requires some type of enterprise platform. And here again, there's tons of flexibility when it comes to implementing. Um, we've implemented on custom platforms. There's off the shelf solutions such as Amplify or Canvas or a couple of examples. You can even use business intelligence tools. We've developed full learning programs within Domo as a BI platform, but that's where employees access the training. Or if you've got SharePoint at your organization, maybe you'll put your training modules there. The one critical thing that I would advise you is don't let the limitations of delivery stop you from starting your program. It's easy to get overwhelmed and say, how are we gonna deliver all this stuff? Don't let that be an impediment. Make sure that you get going in your programs and figure out, then you can figure out how you're gonna actually implement that. So the fifth step I'd like to talk about here is measuring your results. This is really where you get to quantify what your company actually learned. So we certainly recommend measuring results as part of your learning objectives. Teach them and then ask them to apply their newfound knowledge through practical exercises and assessments. A simple way to do this is to be able to, after they either uh, go through a training course or perhaps watch a video about one of these things or review a slide deck, 
uh, quiz them. Say, what did you learn? These are the key concepts we tried to cover here. Did you learn, you know, what did you learn from that? But also real results can be measured in terms of decisions supported by data, new ways of sharing information and collaboration. One of the things that we look for as we develop these programs to identify what the results were is we look for changes in behavior. So behavior changes are things like, hey, we're incorporating data into our daily routines and work streams. We've got common methods for talking about data. People are communicating more effectively about it. Data is now presented in context. Guess what? Everybody understands our metric definitions and our KPI terms. They finally have methods to be able to use the data within their tools. All of these things are changes in behavior that you can use to identify if your data literacy program is working. So what does data literacy really look like? And the spoiler here, if you were paying attention to those definitions, I shared three of them with you, but each of them had some form of understanding and communication baked within them. That's really what it comes down to. Do I understand this and can I talk about it? Can I share it with my peers, with my colleagues? Data literacy is about interpreting, understanding and communicating information. So um, what I'd like to share with you here, uh, this is called Freytag's Pyramid. And this is literally ripped from the pages of one of the search discoveries data literacy modules on data storytelling. Uh, our colleague, Tim Wilson uh, actually built this, but in this data storytelling module, he talks about the beginning, the middle and the end. So I use this to illustrate, you know, we started out the setting. I talked to you about the definitions of data literacy. We talked about those things. I started getting into a little bit of real world examples. And that was the hook. If by the time you saw that flattening the curve graph, you weren't interested in this topic, you probably would have ditched already. But for most of you guys, I had you. And at that point, there were rising insights. We talked a little more about data in everyday world. I showed you some political examples. I talked you through the five-step process for building a, building a, a data literacy program. And we're here. It's that aha moment when you say, really? All that stuff he talked about is practical? I can see that and use that in my literacy modules? The answer is yes. You know, these things really work as you teach. You know, I learned how to tell stories or how to communicate data through many of these modules and talking about them and being able to teach them to others. And then ultimately the end here, we talk about the solutions and the next steps. So I do wanna give a, a nod here to Brent Dykes. Um, we referenced his, effective, his book, Effective Data Storytelling, How to Drive Change with Data Narrative and Visuals. But the fact of the matter is we use data every day. And if we can put it into practical context, whether you're doing a presentation, whether you're just talking in the hallway to someone, all of these things come into play and help us to be able to understand and communicate data. Okay, so the solution and the next steps. How do you, how do you get started on your path to data literacy? Um, if this really is your New Year's resolution, I encourage you, make it realistic, make it sustainable and make it achievable. Just like all those other resolutions that you make, make this one stick, okay? So how do we do that? Begin by recognizing what you need to change. So really think about that. Think about, okay, are there behaviors, do people just not understand what we have in our dashboards? Or is it something more complex? We need to get into data science. We've got a customer lifetime value model that's poorly communicated and nobody understands. Therefore, all of our marketing efforts are, are wasted. Think about it. What do you wanna, Recognize what you need to change. From there, identify your audience or audiences and what you want them to learn. And I say this because there's so often more than one singular audience. We might wanna teach our analysts a way to uh, think about data and present data, but we also need to talk to our executives about how do they consume that data? What expectations should they place on their teams? Really thinking about that uh, and we also have a method to be able to, you know, download our worksheet on how to create a learning objective can help you thinking, think through who you're trying to reach and what is it that you want them to learn. Next up, develop a game plan for how you, you are going to develop your literacy program. I'm a strategist. I love plans. Making plans and figuring out how are we going to execute against this is part of what you need to do here to develop this program. So map it out, really think through you know, how are you going to get there? 
And what, and what I also encourage you to do is market your data literacy initiative internally within your organization. Don't just drop it on them and say, hey, here's the new curriculum. Test it out, try it, make sure that they're thinking about, oh, okay, uh, I know that this is coming. Get them excited about it. Build some, uh, some momentum around your program so that your organization is ready for it. They know what to expect and they know what's coming their way. And then my last point on this slide is, I encourage you to slow roll a pilot program. You do this to assure effectiveness. Uh, what we've seen is that testing your literacy program on a small pilot group of different individuals across your organization to see, oh, they got stuck on this, or this was way too low, we need to set the bar higher. You'll learn a lot from doing a pilot program and getting uh, a number of different individuals to participate so that you can figure out how well your program is actually working. So uh, with that, um, we will open it up for questions. Adam, I'm gonna uh, pass the baton back to you. Um, and as we do that, as you're pondering your questions, I'll just put up some, uh, some resources and links uh, to a few of the things that I mentioned uh, here today. Awesome, thank you so much, John. Um, data literacy is something that I feel like a lot of us uh, neglect because we get so mired down in the day-to-day -day, you know, requests and we sometimes forget to take a step back. So I'm really excited that uh, you were able to present on this topic. And for those of you on the webinar, um, I did put the links that um, John is showing here in the chat. So if it's maybe a little bit easier than trying to uh, scribble them all down. So you can click on all those links in the chat. So uh, if you have any questions for John, uh, we've got a couple minutes now for some Q&A. So please go put them in the Zoom Q&A. And um, looks like we have, right now we just have a couple questions, but I'll start with one from our coworker, Tim. So this is a little bit of a lengthy one, which I would expect nothing less from Tim Wilson. Uh, his question is, how much of data literacy is about how the data is presented, the analyst's responsibility versus the audience's ability to understand the data. A lot of these examples are effective and ineffective data visualizations. Is it a fair analog perhaps to think of this as giving uh, uh, Proust or Joyce or Shakespeare to a fourth grader? The visualization has to meet the audience where their data literacy is. Okay. Well, uh, Tim Wilson, I'm sure that you were reading Shakespeare in fourth grade, but uh, I, I do think um, it is it, a lot of this falls to the analyst. And just like when developing a data literacy curriculum, you need to know your audience. As an analyst, you also need to know your audience. So if you're presenting to an executive that doesn't care about the details, they only want the big picture, you wouldn't walk in there with a 50 slide deck that shows all your calculations and all the behind the scenes math that you did, you tell them the story. So in a large part, um, I think that the responsibility does fall to the analyst or whomever is presenting that data. But there's also a, um, a level of expectation that goes along with being in business. You know, if you're a knowledge worker, uh, there's probably a pretty high level of expectation that you're going to uh, understand or comprehend the fact that you need metrics or KPIs to understand your business. So uh, you know, I wouldn't place the responsibility solely on the analyst. I'd say it starts there and they need to know their audience, but there's also some level of expectation that goes along with that audience to make sure that they are going to be up to speed. And if not, then you have to back up and take the time to explain to them what is it that you're talking about um, and, and, and help level set to make sure that the right context is there for people to be able to absorb information uh, before you, you know, get into your delivery. Okay, so next question, who is best to champion a data literacy initiative within the organization? Is there a role or level of leadership that makes it more effective? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, you know, a lot of times we've seen um, data literacy efforts or initiatives, co initiatives come, come out of groups that support an organization. So whether that's uh, human resources, or other teams that are responsible for knowledge sharing, education, uh, those types of efforts. Um, a lot of times they have the platforms already. You know, if you do, if you've gone through any company training, you know, you might be able to repurpose that type of platform uh, for an audience. Um, so, you know, it, if it's a full groundswell where there's analysts that say, 
they just don't understand me. No one understands me. We need a literacy effort. Uh, you may be shouting into the wind there. Not that that's not a place to start, but what we've seen as most effective is if it comes from a, a centralized uh, position within the organization or someone from leadership uh, declaring it as a mandate, we've seen that work well too. Uh, but really kind of, you know, you are going to need enterprise resources. You are going to need things that span the enterprise. So in, for that reason, uh, having it come from a, a centralized group within the organization is oftentimes the best way to go. Okay, next question. Uh, Paul asks, I have trouble articulating the difference between data literacy and capability uh, capacity to use data tools um, to decision makers. How do I explain literacy beyond the ability to use a new tool? Yeah, so, uh, um, well, I'll reference Tim Wilson. He wrote a blog post about this uh, maybe last year or so, uh, but he talks about in that, in that post, there's metrics literacy, what does our data mean? There's tool literacy, how do I use, uh, whether it's Google or Adobe or whatever the tools um, that you have at your disposal, and then there's really a, um, a, a contextual literacy. And that contextual literacy is, okay, I'm starting to understand the data around me or the data that puts all of this into context. Um, it is a, a, a distinction um, that goes beyond just the tools because to know the tools uh, is one thing, but to be able to literacy, if I were to distill it down, is not necessarily the ability to dive in and use the tools and, and to create some slick analysis, it's the ability to be able to comprehend what somebody's talking about and put it into the context of your business. So I would take that back and say, you know, really it's not just the tools that matter when it comes to literacy, it's how well you can comprehend or understand what the tools are telling us. And can you apply that to a business scenario or situation? So John, I'm going to go rogue and ask my own question. I never get to do this, but um, I'm, as, as you were presenting, I was wondering, is there any type of industry certification on data literacy? I know like the DAA has a um, web analyst certification, but is there any test um, just like you get certified in like Adobe or Google Analytics? Yeah, so, so um, the data literacy project, in fact, uh, just came out with a, a certification test. I have not personally taken it, uh, taken it. Uh, but I do know that they've made one available. Um, the caution is, again, you know, it's difficult to do a one size fits all, you know, literacy test. Uh, just to simply say, oh, look at, you know, all these literate people, um, you know, you're going to have uh, perhaps some subjectivity, some bias that goes into that. Uh, that is the only one that I'm aware of at this time. I know that there's a, you know, that, that one does exist. I believe it's relatively new. Um, but, um, you know, the, the concept itself is still evolving. We're still, we're still getting there the way that we like to do it. You know, we've got an assessment that, that, uh, that I've developed that has a number of questions that help us to gauge literacy at a specific organization. And that tells us, okay, what modules do we need to focus on? What do we need to do? But it, again, it isn't universal. We customize it. Okay. Uh, one last question here. Are data literacy and data minimalism the same thing, or does one stop and the other starts? Ooh. Um, minimalism, I, 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 I'm guessing uh, without any further context is, you know, presenting data without extraneous lines or visuals or making it clear and concise when you present it. Um, I do believe that that's different. You know, that's a facet of data literacy. But I think that there's a, a pretty big distinction there. Um, you know, you could boil down minimalism to, you know, how can I, uh, in the most concise way, communicate uh, effectively, you know, interpret and communicate information. That's part of data literacy. But I would love to think that the overall definitions of literacy are, are larger than that. You know, it involves visualization. But it also involves all of the other things we talked about, you know, putting data in context, aligning it with what matters to your business, um, you know, so many different uh, uh, facets and things about literacy that span beyond just the way that it's presented, um, I think should be considered there. Okay, and I lied because we got a new question that now I, I want to hear your answer from. Um, might the definition of literacy be extended to include data beyond decision making, for example, machine learning? and automation uses. And I think where Paul is going with this question is, is it like in the future, is it that like, you know, machine algorithms are going to have to be data literate or something? That's what I kind of was wondering if that's where he was going. 
Uh, Paul, heck yeah, is what I would say to that. Um, and, and, and that's a great example of extending this. You know, I didn't mention uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, but effectively, you know, things that are being programmed, um, we need to kind of see behind the veil, behind the curtain of what are, how are these decision, decisions being made. Part of being data literate is to understand the algorithms. And I think we all get frustrated by uh, black box type scenarios where you're like, why did I get recommended that? Or why did this happen? Um, part of data literacy, you know, maybe not every consumer or every person needs to understand that, but someone sure does. You know, you can't just let the machines run the world. I think that there has to be some logic and a level of literacy that goes into understanding whether it's programming your objectives to say, this is what I need as outcomes or simply monitoring uh, the decision factors uh, that, a, that an algorithm or a machine learning or AI type of um, uh, concept might use, um, certainly that falls into the category of literacy. Awesome. Okay, well, we are wrapped. Uh, thank you so much, John, for presenting, and thanks, everyone, for being here for another SDEC session. Um, John, this was awesome. Thanks again for presenting. Thank you.